Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to today's um, regular meeting of the Honolulu Board of Water Supply. It is June 28, uh, 2021. Uh, my name is uh, Brian and I am the board chair. And I'd like to take a moment to take a roll call of the board members, um, both uh, um, joining here in the boardroom with myself <coughs> um, and also via WebEx. Uh, when I say your name, uh, please say aye. Board member Matt Sword. Aye. Right. Okay, and then those of you on WebEx, board member Jade Butai. Aye. And board member Roger Babcock. Aye. All right, thank you very much. And this is noted, and as uh, other board members um, call in, uh, we will note their uh, presence. All right, also in the room with us are um, manager Ernie, Ernest Lau, board secretary Joy Cruz Ashu, and information specialist Stephen Narsha. Uh, and on the telephone with us, or actually WebEx, on WebEx with us, are Jeff Lau and Jessica Wong both from the City and County Corporation Council Department. This is a friendly reminder that those of you who are participating remotely, please mute your microphone at this time and unmute yourself only when you intend to speak. Uh, when you speak, uh, please identify your name, uh, identify yourself so we can um, note, note it for the record. Before beginning today's regular meeting, I'd like to state that this board is dedicated to providing safe, dependable, and affordable uh, drinking water or uh, water supply of water now and into the future. Presently, we are still bound by the 21st proclamation of Governor David Ige on June 7, 2021, to follow public participation in a manner consistent with social distancing practices. The following procedures are in effect for this meeting. First, we have board members who are participating from remote locations via WebEx. Testimony. Testimony can be submitted as follows. Um, the following uh, testimony was due by today, Monday, June 28th at, at 12 noon. They could have been written testimony, emailed to board at hbws.org or fax to 808-748-5079. Um, written testimony will be posted to the BWS website at board of water supplies spelled out.com. We also were accepting uh, testimony by mail to our address, physical address here at 630 South Garitania Street, Honolulu, Hawaii 96843. Finally, um, we were accepting testimony online at boardofwatersupply.com slash testimony. Online testimony was due by today, uh, Monday, June 28, 2021 at noon. However, I believe you still can um, submit your testimony and it will be noted for the record. Finally, we are presently accepting telephone testimony. If you decide to testify, you can call 808 Seven four eight six zero four zero. Again, that number is 808-748-6040. Callers will be placed in a queue, um, brought up to testify one at a time, and we'll provide further instructions at that time. Again, we will we are taking testimony at the moment by telephone. Unfortunately, in-person testimony cannot be accepted due to the COVID-19 pandemic and the need for social distancing. All right, materials for today's um, meeting, um, which is the board packet under HRS section 92-7.5 are accessible on our website at www.boardofwatersupplyspelledout.com slash board meeting. If you'd like to view today's meeting, uh, it is viewable via live streaming on our website at www.boardofwatersupply.com slash live. Um, and also, I, I believe we still um, publish our meetings um, after the fact 
via Olelo. All right, today we have four items on our agenda requiring board action. The first item is the approval of the minutes of the public hearing and the regular meeting held on May 24, 2021. May I have a motion to accept uh, the minutes? Uh, so moved, Mr. Chair. Thank you, board member Soon. Is there a sure. second? Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, board, board member Sword, sorry. Is there a second? Second. All right, now seconded by member Vapa. Um, is there any questions or discussions, corrections? Uh, hearing none, um, uh, Mr. Nostrum, is there anyone on the, the line to test? No testimony, Chair. Sure. Thank you very much. All right, um, if there's no discussion, I'm going to call for the question. All those in favor say aye. 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 Thank you. I believe I heard uh, three eyes by members uh, Sword, Babcock, and Butai. Is there, are there any nays opposing the motion? Do we get an aye from you, Mr. Chair? Um, yes, and I, I also will vote aye. So <laughs> the motion does uh, pass unanimously. Thank you very much. All right, next one is the adoption of resolution number 925-2021. This is for reimbursement of capital expenditures from the proceeds of indebtedness. Uh, chair recognizes Mr. Joe Cooper. Um, good afternoon, Chair Board, Chair Board members. Um, I'm here to um, recommend the adoption of resolution number 925 on 2021. Um, it's the reimbursement of capital expenditure for the proceeds of indebtedness. Um, generally, we call this our reimbursement resolution, um, and it goes hand in hand with the um, revenue bonds that we issued in March. This um, gives us a little flexibility in applying those proceeds to our capital project. Um, it establishes a time limit of 18 months and brings us into compliance with Section 1.150 of the U.S. Treasury regulations. Also, it does not bind the board to um, make any expenditures or incur any indebtedness. Um, okay, uh, members, any questions? If not, may I have a motion uh, to accept uh, resolution number 925-2021 regarding the reimbursement of capital expenditures from the proceeds of indebtedness. So moved, Mr. Chair. Second. By, thank you. Uh, moved by member Sword, second by member Babcock. Uh, is there any further discussion or questions? Hearing none, I'm going to call for the question. All those in favor say aye. Uh, aye. aye. Great. Um, the director reflected. I received ayes from members Sword, Babcock, and Dupai, and I will vote aye as well. Uh, is there any in opposition? Please say nay. Okay, hearing none, um, motion passes uh, resolution number 925 2021 is hereby adopted. Item number three of the agenda requiring board action is the adoption of resolution 926-2021, authorizing up to $50 million of principal amount of series 2021 state revolving fund water system revenue loan. Chair recognizes Mr. Joe Cooper. Um, good afternoon. Um, if the board recommends the adoption of resolution 926-2021, um, to authorize $50 million in principle of state revolving water funds. Um, the SRF program um, is a state program using federal and state money to help subsidize um, water structure, water system improvements. 
Um, on the last loan, um, which was resolution 900, um, it was again for $50 million. We negotiated four loans with an interest rate of between three quarters of a percent and 1.15% um, with um, loan fees of 1% so that our total cost of capital on these loans was between 1.75 and 2.15%. Really a, a pretty good interest rate on this amount. Um, we were able to um, support 22 infrastructure projects on um, which are listed in the resolution. And so we um, yes, recommend adoption of this so that we can continue to um, exercise new loans with the state revolving loans program. Okay, thank you. Um, members, any questions? Um, okay, um, hearing none, I just will comment that this uh, program uh, is has proved very useful for us. Um, funding, as Mr. Cooper said, 22 different infrastructure improvement projects. Um, and they also provide monies to pay the cost of improvements to the water system authorized in our uh, capital budget and to also make a deposit to SRF series reserve accounts um, where necessary and to pay costs of issuance of series 2021 loans. So Joe, this is part of the um, CIT budget? It is in the CIT, yes, the SRF is in the CIT budget. Okay. And, and the, the structure of the loans, um, are they loan us actually this year, they're forecasting the loan is $11.5 million. Um, and we get to apply those to actually um, expenditures that have already been completed. And so every year we allocate a certain amount of CIP projects to be covered by the um, state revolving loan program. Okay, yeah, that's basically, it's not above and beyond the CIP, it's part of the CIP. It's part yes. of the CIP. It funds a portion of the CIP, yeah. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. That's all I have, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Um, members, any other questions? Okay, hearing none, uh, all those uh, in favor say aye. 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 All right, I have eyes from members Sword, Babcock, and Butai. I will also vote aye. Uh, it would be very helpful if we didn't have a motion, though. <laughs> I was just about to say, I don't think I remember. Um, <laughs> so, um, so, moved by. Um, so moved. Member Sword has moved. Second. Member Babcock has um, seconded. Um, let's try this one more time. All those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed say nay. All right, we have eyes from Member Sword, Babcock, Kutai, and myself. Um, and is there anyone opposing? Please say nay. nay. All right, um, hearing none, uh, we have unanimous uh, agreement on this. Um, we hereby adopt resolution number 926 2021. The next item is item number four. Thank you, Joe. Thank you. Um, approval to seek public input on draft changes to the water systems facilities charges. Chair recognizes uh, Dave Eversole and Barry Usagal. Good afternoon, Chair, members of the board. Um, Ernie, did you want to do an introduction of this item? Uh, yeah, actually, uh, and Barry's here too. I, Great. Just, want, uh, just so, so very briefly, uh, uh, this is actually a, a proposal here. Uh, to be get the board's support to start seeking, seeking public input on some draft changes to our water system facilities charges. And I uh, will bring that up shortly. Um, the last time the facilities charges was changed or uh, well, it goes back to the 1990s, I think around 1993. Uh, so Barry, Busagawa, head of our water resources division, and Dave Ebersolt have been working on an update to the water system facilities charges. Water system facilities charges are basically the impact fees to that we would uh, 
uh, charge new customers coming on to the system, to our water system that would use capacity that was already developed by previous customers that had paid into the system. Uh, so it helps to pay for expansion and capacity uh, to our water system to meet the de new demands. Uh, Joy, I'd like to have Barry come up there uh, to the podium. Although if you want to stay, you can stay. <laughs> so, Barry, go ahead. Uh, would you like to add a little uh, more to that, Barry? Um, not too much, Ernie. Uh, hello, <laughs> hello uh, Mr. Chair and members. Um, yeah, we, we've been, as Ernie was saying, 1993. So um, again, it would only be applicable to new development or expansion of existing services. So it pays for the, the source transmission and inf uh, uh, storage infrastructure for growth related projects. And it helps to uh, offset the costs of uh, bonds and and uh, infrastructure paid by rates. So uh, appreciate your consideration. Thank you. Uh, one, one thing to note, uh, board, is that this is uh, this is a draft uh, proposal that we would like to go out to the public and to various stakeholders to seek their input on this proposal. Uh, we're not asking the board to take an action at this time to adopt the changes, but just to give us the uh, authorization to proceed forward with the uh, community engagement and uh, uh, information process here on this draft proposal. And we have uh, uh, Barry and Dave Ebersol is going to do a uh, PowerPoint presentation. Uh, on uh, what we're considering as a draft proposal for outreach. Uh, Dave, go ahead. Great, thank you. Uh, thanks, everybody. So as was mentioned, the water system facilities charge is a one-time charge with two purposes. Uh, it's paid by a customer when they connect to the system for the first time or when they need additional capacity from the system. So if they need to upsize their meter. As Barry mentioned, it funds growth-related capacity expansions to the system, and it equitably recovers earlier investments that the board made in oversizing infrastructure to accommodate new customers. For example, when you build a, uh, you need a 12-inch water main, for example, to serve a new area, but you might oversize it to 16 inches, knowing that it's gonna need to be bigger in the future, it's more cost of effect cost effective to install that larger size now that larger size now excuse me and then recover those costs as people uh connect to the system for the first time think of it as a membership fee to connect to bws's system it's only for the backbone that is those parts of the system that are used by everybody so the sources treatment transmission and storage it doesn't cost cover the costs of the smaller pipes that go to individual houses for example Next slide. Uh, as was mentioned, the current charges were adopted way back in 1993, and an awful lot has changed since then. Um, most importantly, costs have increased, and the current revenues that the board gets from the water system facilities charge do not cover the costs of your growth related projects. Next slide. There's five basic steps to updating the water system facilities charge. Uh, this basic framework is laid out in the AWWA, uh, American Water Works Association, uh, Manual M1, which is the premier guidance document for establishing water rates and charges in the United States. The first is to develop the existing available capacity in the backbone system and assign a monetary value to it. Then from the water master plan and your 10-year infrastructure investment plan or CIP, Identify the costs of the additions and upgrades that are necessary to meet growth and assign costs to those. Then estimate how much capacity each customer type needs in terms of gallons per day per fixture unit. Fixture unit is probably not a term you're familiar with. It's a measure of how fast it takes a certain amount of water to drain through a one and a quarter inch pipe. Um, it's, it's a measure of the water coming out of a faucet, for example. Then calculate the updated costs and evaluate the policy and implementation issues, which is really where we have been for the past period of time. Uh, a number of you may remember previous presentations to this board about the water system facilities charge. Next. 
The principles used in the design of this facilities charge or impact fee uh, are guided by uh, Hawaii, Hawaii revised statutes. Uh, it may only be imposed for capital improvements that are specifically identified in a study. And for you, this is your water master plan. It needs to be substantially related to the needs that arise from the given development. It can't exceed the proportionate share of costs that arise from that development. So you can't charge somebody more than, than what the associated costs are. There needs to be a reasonable, uh, the collection and expenditure of fees needs to be reasonably related to the benefits that accrue. So if you're collecting fees to um, provide capacity in the system, then they need to be, be getting that capacity. Um, importantly, the collection of the fee shall be a condition precedent to the issuance of a permit and shall be collected in full. This has come up in the past as a question about whether or not you could uh, have a customer pay the fee over time. And the answer to that is it does not appear that that's the case given HRS. And another element here is to promote conservation and efficiency. So if uh, folks can be encouraged to not put as many uh, water using fixtures into a development, um, they implement water conservation from the get go as that development is being built, then they pay a lower fee in connecting to the system. Next slide. Sorry, David, um, I'm going to interrupt. So um, these are pretty much right out of the statute, um, HRS uh, section 26-141. All but the sixth one, that's correct. Okay, thank you. Can we just join? Yeah, our chair. Sorry, Emily. Um, sorry, I'm sorry about that. Uh, chair recognizes um, uh, member, board member race very soon, uh, who has um, joined, the, joined us today. Thank you, Ray. So after completing the technical evaluations of, uh, of, of the water system facilities charge for each of the various customer classes, um, to get to uh, what that new charge should be uh, to cover the costs associated with both the, the buy-in to the existing system and the cost to um, for new facilities to support growth, charge for new single family residential connections would go up 18.4%. For multi unit low rise, which is three stories or less, it would go up 6.5%. For multi unit high rise, which is more than three stories, it would go up 7.8%. For non residential customers, uh, your commercial and industrial and governmental accounts, it would go down. 40% if they have less than 50 fixture units, and I'll explain that in just a second. And it would go up more than, uh, it would go up proportionally uh, for folks with more than 50 fixture units as the number of fixture units increases. For agricultural customers, there would be relatively large incre increases that reflect these customers' actual increase, uh, actual water usage. And I'll go through each of these in a little bit of detail right now. Next slide. So as I mentioned, for single family residential customers, uh, the charge would go up 18.4%. In talking with your stakeholder advisory group about this, uh, their recommendation was to implement the, the proposed change, um, phase it in over a three year period to try and minimize the shock um, and to consider waiving the uh, more than 500 units of homeless and low income housing per year if the 500 unit cap that your board has enacted already is achieved before the end of the fiscal year and to consider requiring that those who get those waivers uh, are required to incorporate the use of non potable water if that's possible. Uh, the rates permitted interaction group of the board has also met a number of times regarding the water system facilities charge and their input has been to uh, look at a couple of different things here. First, to consider limiting the increase to no more than 5% per year. And second option would be to consider a phase in ev evenly over five years. So let's take a look at each of those options. This is an increase of 5% maximum per year. The current charge is shown uh, to the far left hand side of the table. 
Um, if you look at the dark blue line at the bottom, this is the total charge for a single family residence with 20 fixture units. That's a typical three bedroom, two bath house. And that's the minimum amount that the BWS charges, a minimum of 20 fixture units. So the charge is currently $3,700. It would need to go up to $4,389. Under this option, it would increase 5% the first year, 5% the next year, 5% the third year, 2.29% in the final year. So you'd reach that new target charge in the fourth year. And you can see the uh, calculations for uh, 25 fixture units and 30 fixture units respectively, just as examples, 30 fixture units would be a larger house, uh, maybe uh, you know, four or five bedrooms, three or four bathrooms, that type of a, a residence. So that gives you an example of, of the change. The next option, next slide. The next option is exactly the same starting point and end point, but it's an equal phase in uh, by percentage over that five year period. And you can see the percentages are 3.43 each time with a small adjustment in the last year just to balance things out. So roughly 3.43% for each of five years gets to that full charge in the five year period. Next slide. Now for multi-unit uh, uh, residential, again, there's low rise, which is three stories or less, and then high rise, which is more than three stories. The increases are six and a half and 7.8% respectively. The stakeholder advisory group's recommendation was to implement this proposed charge without any phase in. Uh, and again, to um, have the board consider waiving the uh, number of units of homeless and low income housing per year if that 500 unit cap is achieved. The permitted interaction group input has been to um, similarly consider limiting it to 5% per year or alternatively an even phase in over five years. So let's take a look at each of those options. For multi-unit low rise, the current charge for uh, a 20 fixture unit development is 54.25 it would need to go up to 57.79, um, a 5% increase the first year, then 1.45%, and then it's at the target level. Uh, for a development of 250 fixture units, that development would currently pay $67,800 to connect to the system for the first time. That would go up at the end of this series of increases to $72,240. Next slide, if we were to look at an even phase in over a five year period, again, the starting points and the ending points are the same, but it's an even percentage increase each year. Next slide. Oh, here we are. So this is for high rise. Uh, here we're looking at an increase uh, for 100 fixture units going from $20,000 to about $22,000. And you can see the annual increases here at a 5% maximum. For 1,000 fixture units, this would be a pretty major development. They pay $204,000 currently, and that would go up to just about $220,000. If it were to be phased in equally over five years, it would look like this, with increases about 1.5% per year. Again, the starting numbers and the ending numbers are the same. It's just a more gradual increase. Okay, for non-residential customers, this is a bit of a different system. The way the charge is currently structured is that for the first 50 fixture units, you pay a higher amount. And then for each fixture unit above that, it's a lower amount. And the idea with this charge was established was that the more fixture units a, um, a non-residential customer had, the more efficient was their water use by fixture unit. And when we look at the data now for your customers due to changes in water use patterns, changes in plumbing codes, those types of differences aren't apparent. There's no apparent difference in efficiency of water usage in non-residential customers based on the number of fixture units. So the recommendation is to eliminate that differential. 
in effect, this results in a decrease in the charge of about 40% for customers with 50 fixture units and fewer. And then the charge would increase for customers with higher numbers of fixture units and the percentage increase is a function of the number of fixture units that they have. And so that's why those percentages are different depending on the number of fixture units. Just for some reference here, um, 20 fixture units might be a fast food restaurant, uh, 250 fixture units, maybe a medium sized shopping center, uh, a larger shopping center, maybe you know, 900, 1000 fixture units, a large resort hotel would have something on the order of 3,500 fixture units. So when you look at the costs of those um, of those larger uh, customers, like a, a shopping center, a large resort hotel, as a percentage of their total development costs, the charges that we're talking about here are fairly small. That's something that was important to the stakeholder advisory group as they looked at this. We go to the next slide. Their recommendation was to implement these proposed changes. And uh, again, part of their rationale was that uh, as a as a element of the total cost of these developments, these charges are pretty small. The permitted interaction group input has been over a concern with the large percentage differences across the number of fixture units in, in those higher fixture unit customers. And so to consider maybe a three year or a five year phase in of this change and to provide your board with some options to look at. So let's take a look at those options. So as I mentioned, if you have uh, 50 or fewer fixture units, your charge would drop initially. And actually the way the formula works is if you have 133 or fewer fixture units, the charge would drop. This is a big benefit to small businesses in particular. For those uh, non-residential customers with more than 133 fixture units, the charge would increase. And again, you see the amount of that increase changes based on the number of fixture units. So if we were to phase this in over say three years, the first year would look like the following. Next slide. That full drop for 133 and fewer fixture units would happen in the first year. And then for those with more fixture units, you'd see an incremental increase in the first year. Next slide. And another increase in the second year. Next slide. And a third increase in that final year to take us to that full charge. Go to the next slide. Here's what it would look like in graphs similar that, to what I was showing you for the other customer types. Again, the current charges are shown in the black box to the far left-hand side of the chart, a phase in over three years. The target charges for 133 and fewer fixture units would be met in the first year because you have to drop them down. You can't charge somebody more. And for the other customer types, we'd phase in over three years. Next slide. If it was to be evened out over a five-year period, it would look like this, more even, more predictable. Now, the water system facilities charge for agricultural customers is a bit different. The, exist, the structure of the existing charge is based on the idea that an agricultural customer uses water as if they were a single family residential customer. So back in 1993, a three quarter inch meter was assigned 36 fixture units and a two inch meter was assigned 350 fixture units. Next slide. When we look at those updated fixture unit counts today based on water conservation changes, plumbing code changes, we see that single family residences actually on a three quarter inch meter typically have only 20 fixture units. And on a two inch meter, they typically only have about 150 fixture units. So people have a lot fewer fixture units for these meter sizes in their homes today. The issue with that is kind of intriguing. That means if you were to apply this change to agricultural customers, their water system facilities charge would actually decrease and decrease significantly. But here's the thing. Next slide. We know that in one day, the average BWS agricultural customer uses 6,000 gallons of water. 
which is more than half of your residential customers use in an entire month. Thinking about it another way, agricultural customers are about three tenths of a percent of your total customer base, but they use two and a half percent of the total potable water on the system. So another way to think to look at how to charge these customers based on their actual water usage, rather than thinking of them as a single family residence, is to look at the capacity associated with those various meter sizes. This is a methodology established in the AWWA M1 manual. And so if we were to take this type of an approach, the current charge for a three quarter inch meter is shown with the blue dot it's around $6,000 is my recollection. It would go up to over $20,000 using this methodology. At the other end of the spectrum, a two inch meter, the customer current pay, currently pays about $64,000 to connect. And that charge would go up to something on the order of $140,000. So those are really huge increases. Next slide. We've talked extensively with the stakeholder advisory group uh, other agricultural stakeholders gotten input from the permitted interaction group. And here's what the stakeholder advisory group has suggested is to implement this proposed charge, but to phase it in and limit those increases to 10% per year. To include a requirement for a water use plan to help new farmers right size their water meters from the get go. Um, some of the uh, indications in talking with agricultural stakeholders is that farmers put in the largest meter that they can afford rather than necessarily a meter that it isn't any larger than what they need. So this would be an attempt to get at that issue and help them not pay more money than what they actually need to. Finally, to provide sufficient outreach and education to the agricultural community and involve other agencies in that process. One of the things that the stakeholder advisory group, in particular, the agricultural members on that group had pointed out is that these types of changes, in their opinion, wouldn't prevent anyone from going into farming as, as their livelihood. The input from the permitted interaction group has been to consider uh, options down in the five to 8% uh, phase in uh, range as opposed to 10% suggested by the stakeholder advisory group. And let's take a look at what those options look like. Um, one of the elements here has been that if you look at your current water rate structure for agricultural customers, you might recall that they pay only 60% of their cost of service. So a fun, a foundational idea here with the uh, water system facilities charge would be to establish a similar target rate where you ultimately only charge them 60% of the full charge. Currently, the percent of, the, of that that they pay ranges um, quite widely. Um, two inch meters pay about 48% of the charge. Uh, a one inch meter, they only pay about 28, 25, 28% of it. So the idea here is to get everybody to that 60% recovery level over a period of time. That's the first concept. Next slide. If those changes were be to, to be phased in so that the increase on any meter size was no more than 10% per year, then for the three quarter inch meter in light blue down at the bottom, you can see the current charge is about $6,400. It would go up to a little over $10,000 and it would reach that 60% target in nine years. For the one inch meter, the current charge is a little over $10,000. During the five year period, it would go up to about 18,000 and it would reach that 60% target in about 10 years. Uh, the target would be reached for the one and a half inch meter in about six years. And for the two inch meter under this scenario it could be reached in three years. So that's a 10% maximum per year phase in. Next slide. If we instead looked at a 6% annual increase, again, we're just stretching things out, flattening it out. It would take 15 years to reach that target charge level for the three quarter inch meter. Uh, for the 
two inch meter, it could be reached in five years. And you can see these, uh, these gradual changes, long time periods for both the one inch and one and a half inch meter sizes. And finally, flatten it out just a little bit more, 5% per year. Uh, it takes six years to get to that 60% target level on the two inch meter up at the top. And uh, 19 years for the one inch meter uh, in orange close to the bottom. Again, these are 5% increases per year. Next slide. The third element of this, as I mentioned, a water use plan for new customers. Uh, this would be required prior to the issuance of a new or an upsized meter. It's a pretty simple idea. Identify the planned irrigation area, apply a unit water demand per acre, uh, and then right size the meter around that concept. Again, the idea here is to make sure the meter isn't bigger than it needs to be, uh, so it doesn't encourage wasteful irrigation practices in perpetuity and to also help the customer not pay more for the meter than they need to. Next slide. Encouraging conservation for all BWS uh, ag customers is an important element here and BWS has been expand, uh, exploring a memorandum of understanding with uh, HDOA and the uh, Center for Tropical Agricultural and Human Resources at UH Manoa. Uh, also looking at other collaborations for water conservation uh, looking at um, uh, implementing conservation incentives and rebates into the conservation program and allowing, this is currently done, allowing for water bill adjustments once in five years if leaks are repaired. Uh, Barry, I don't know if you had any updates to this you wanted to provide or additional comments. Uh, no, no, not at this time, Dave. Um, the, right. we, yeah. Okay. Thank you. Next slide. The fifth element here is pursuing and utilizing supplemental funding from the state or other sources to offset revenue impacts of these um, reduced fees or long-term phase-in for agricultural customers. So actually in 2019, the state legislature passed Act 40, which provides an appropriation of a million dollars in CIP funds to the Department of Land and Natural Resources uh, to for the BWS to offset the design and construction costs for an exploratory well in Upper Kenia. Um, due to new federal uh, Food Safety Modernization Act rules, the funds would be used to help offset some of the capacity impact fees for new farmers to support the ag industry on Oahu. The BWS will apply the state contribution to buy down the water system facilities charge for farmers on the BWS island-wide system. Um, this well station is Malka of the proposed State Canuda Ag Park and could provide potable water for crop washing of leafy vegetables, for example. Um, in several areas uh, on Oahu, access to the BWS municipal system is the only source of potable irrigation supply that FISMA requires. On, in January, uh, the DLNR and BWS received approval by the State Board of Land and Natural Resources to enter into a memorandum of agreement to transfer the CIP funds to BWS for this project. And the DLNR has submitted a request to, gov to the governor to release those CIP funding. So this is that is pending right now. Finally, um, the process of implementing something like this and monitoring its effectiveness over that implementation period is important. So following the implementation or concurrent with it, it's important to establish metrics for the ag water conservation program elements that we've been talking about and also the conservation goals. Couple that with monitoring and reporting both on the number of new ag customers and their meter sizes and also on um, reporting on conservation metrics. And then at the end of a five year period, reevaluate the effectiveness of this program uh, during the next update of your water system facilities charge. Next slide. So, in summary, the options that we've been talking about for single family residential customers would be to either uh, take these increases at a 5% maximum per year or to phase in evenly over five years. Same thing for multi unit residential. Uh, low rise and high rise and also non-residential customers. So those are options one and two. 
And then for agricultural customers, the options are for a 10% maximum increase, a 6% maximum increase, or a 5% maximum increase. A schedule for this, next slide. Uh, we're in June, so your consideration of authorizing uh, outreach for these proposals, that customer outreach would then begin, continue on into the summer, might be looking at going to the Small Business Regulatory Review Board uh, also during the summer in August timeframe, coming back for your board's consideration of these changes and holding of a public hearing in the September, early fall timeframe, then submitting the required uh, post-hearing small business impact statement and uh, looking at then a final report uh, on these changes in the October timeframe. During that period of time afterwards, um, public outreach would continue. There'd be staff training to implement these changes uh, with, with customers in the April, May, June of 2022 front timeframe. And the two new charges could be effective at the start of your next fiscal year, July 1st, 2022. And maybe it's best if we back up one slide to those different options. Any questions? Uh, yeah, could you go back to the um, at the beginning just for my I just need to know um, on the difference uh, on the backbone system. If you can just kind of go over that one more time, just so I can understand it a little better. Sure, absolutely. Sure. I think that's the second slide. Yeah, yeah. I so, it might be second slide, yeah. yeah, so the. The idea here is that the Board of Water Supply provides the same level of service, both in reliability and water quality to all your customers across the island, regardless of where they're located. There's a backbone system that fills that need. It consists of all of your sources of supply, the treatment systems, the transmission mains, the large pipes, and then the storage tanks that are located in the system that help provide a consistent pressure throughout the system. So that's what the backbone of the system is. And that's what okay. this charge goes to pay for. Okay. So, so uh, what we're proposing on in the increase uh, supports that whole system is what you're saying. It's yes, exactly. It supports the growth of that system. The, the increases in either the size or the extent of it that are ne needed to support growth. Okay. All right. Thank you. If I may add, that growth is identified by the Department of Planning and Permitting yeah. through, yeah. through their approval of the subdivisions and their land use plans. So. Uh, my second question is on the um, on the increase in charges um, on the non residential below 50 fixtures it's going to decrease by 40% uh, non residential above 50 uh, will increase now it, does that affect like the um, uh, affordable uh, income housing or you know for affordable housing does that have an effect on the charges. It, it should not have any effect there. Um, uh, affordable housing, uh, low income housing would all be residential. Uh, so it would be covered either in single family residential, low rise or high rise res residential. Oh, so no, uh, I'm, I'm sorry. I, I, it's uh, I, I'm I'm residential. Yeah. Yeah. No, I messed up on the, um, on the, on the question. Sorry. My, no problem. My question was on the multi-unit high-rise, which um, is where most of the uh, uh, affordable uh, housing units are uh, residing in. But that's an increase of 7.8. Would that affect the, the um, affordable housing component? So currently, the Board of Water Supply waives the water system facilities charge for affordable housing and low income housing up to a maximum of 500 units per year. I believe you've also authorized the manager to go a bit above that uh, if, if that cap is reached before the end of the year. So the stakeholder so advisory group recommended that you consider waiving more than 500 units. So that's a policy decision that is available to your board. 
So Matt, Max, uh, board member of SORG, the current program, which is a board adopted, um, passed uh, back in 2018, basically authorizes us for affordable housing, qualified affordable housing owner owned or rentals and homeless housing units up to 500 units a year to be waived. Uh, and this is, and uh, just for your information, this is the first year that we actually exceeded 500 units. With the last project, we actually went a little bit over 500 units, uh, but that that would waive this charge for those uh, for those type of units. Okay, so there is a waiver that that. But the uh, but, we, uh, the yeah. board what will be, will be done next, starting next uh, fiscal year, which is in July 1st. Uh, we're going to begin a new rate study, uh, which is separate. This is not water system facilities charges or related to our impact fees, uh, but uh, we are going to do a rate study that's related to water rates. And the that's an opportunity for the board to also consider at that time to say extend the program of waivers for affordable units from these types of charges and uh, meter charges. Uh, to go on uh, for another five year period if the board would choose or uh, because the next set of rates that we're going to do be doing uh, development on are for a five year period. So the current program would run out uh, uh, in 2020, uh, I'm sorry, 2022 will be the last, uh, 2023. Okay, then uh, I guess the second question I have, which I might kind of messed up on the first question. Okay, go ahead. Uh, you know, you mentioned that it was 3,500 uh, fixtures on large resort hotels. That's approximately how many rooms uh, would you consider as a large resort hotel? Oh, something on the order of a, of a Sheraton or um, uh, what, something at that scale. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Very, very large. Well, good luck if you see another one built. Uh, but <laughs> the one thing to note, though, what we're looking at is actually a decrease if you're uh, fixed, 50 fixture units or less um, in their charges. Okay, so that. And that would be that, more on the order of uh, like a fast food or, or a small market. Um, uh, so it's basically smaller businesses. Okay, yeah, I, I, I got to reread re through this again for the most. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chair. I just need to read through this a little more. And uh, keep in mind, uh, board members, you know, all we're doing is asking for board authorization to go to the public outreach process with with this draft proposal. Uh, and uh, depending on the comments that are received, we may come back. Uh, with a, a different proposal to the board later uh, after we go through this process. Yeah, this is just to start the process. Yeah, no, I understand yeah. that. I just, yeah. And then um, maybe I can add, um, so as part, I was part of the permitted interaction group along with, um, I believe, uh, Vice Chair Stroh. And basically you saw where we um, had comments and our main thinking was, uh, we wanted as much as possible to avoid rate shock. We know that we have to um, bring update these charges so that we can fully recover our costs. But at the same time, we wanted to avoid rate shock, which is um, why we um, suggested some of those uh, revisions. But we can talk about it more, and we'll see what the input yeah. is from. No, I, I understand that. Yeah, uh, I just have. One more question on your uh, timeline. You have customer outreach all the way through, even though you don't. Uh, this is more just uh, going out for comments. Is that what it is? That first part, prior, uh, prior to approval by the board. Yeah, this is actually getting that authorization. But we realize that uh, customer outreach and uh, engagement process, even after the board adopt some uh, new uh, rates, uh, new water system facility charges. We'll continue to have to do education for our customers uh, even after uh, it takes effect. Um, and that's, that's what, 
But prior to that, you basically just kind of looking for input from them. Is that what uh, yeah, we're going to engage them, see, uh, put this draft on the table, uh, these options, and seek their feedback and input and suggestions. Okay. And then once the board, uh, if the board reaches a place where it feels comfortable to adopt something, uh, even after that, uh, you know, we'll continue to do outreach to our customers because we need to educate them, them on what's coming. I, this is Ray. Can I ask a question? Go ahead, Ray. Um, can you go back to the slide that has the decreasing of charges before it increases rather significantly? One more back, one more, some more, some more, 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 more. Okay, why, help me understand why there's a decrease. Uh, what happens, the idea is in the current structure of the charge is that um, if you have 50 or fixture, 50 or fewer fixture units, it's assumed, mm -hmm. it's, it's assumed that the water use efficiency in those fifth, first 50 fixture units is low. So the charge you pay for, for each of those 50 fixture units is pretty high. Yeah, stop here. Okay. And okay, so you want to get eventually to 130, 422? Is that what we're you're saying you want to do? I mean, is that an endpoint target or is really the target the increase in percentages? The the, the target is uh um is is not so much the percentage the here's the 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 uh, how do i explain this um let's go to yeah uh, back up one slide so the charge per fixture unit right now is very different for the first okay. 50 fixture units the charge is really high for each okay. fixture unit after that it's lower okay. what were suggesting is that the charge per fixture unit should be the same regardless of the number of fixture units because that's there isn't a difference in the efficiency of water use whether you have 10 fixture units or 100 fixture units you're using water that efficiency per fixture unit is still the same so what that means is that the cost would the charge per fixture unit for those people who have 50 or fewer would go down. And for each fixture unit above 50, it would go up. And so that's why you see that that drop for people that have fewer fixture units and a gradual increase the more fixture units you have. So we're just trying to get everybody to pay the same amount per fixture unit. That's the goal. Okay, can we go back to that um, chart that had the negatives? Keep going, keep going, keep going. You know, that, 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 stop, stop. Um, how long will it get take to get from the first column to the fourth column? Oh, I see. Those are per unit. Those, those are, are those are number that's of fixed units. Right. Okay, that's it's not, not time. time. That's not time. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Okay. I think I understand now. Thank you. Okay. You're welcome. Um, Chair recognizes board member um, Nalehu Anthony uh, is has joined us. Uh, welcome, board member. Uh, uh, apologies to the uh, the chair for being tardy. No worries. Board members, uh, any uh, further uh, comments and questions? Again, uh, this uh, motion here, or I'll be asking for a motion. Uh, is to move to approve um, the dissemination of this uh, plan and and to seek outreach uh, from the public. 
Uh, yeah, I have some questions, uh, Chair. Um, I guess so the intention now is to take this, uh, take these options out to, I guess, to the public and get and get feedback. I, I noticed um, maybe the first question is um, one of the later slides showed um, some options, options one, two, and three. Um, but those didn't seem to have the uh, stakeholder, the stakeholder group seemed to um, didn't seem to had some different op different uh, recommendations than those options one, two, and three. Um, would those be presented also? Um, because on some of them, they said uh, no phase in, for example, which I agree with, I happen to agree with. <laughs> so, um, <laughs> Is that, uh, will that be presented or it wasn't on the list? I, I don't have any slides that present that in this presentation, but those are certainly uh, available for discussion and consideration. The, the numbers, uh, if you didn't phase anything in, then the for single family residential, it would be uh, an immediate 18.4% increase. Uh, the numbers for multi-unit residential are six and a half to a little over 7%. Uh, and then, of course, we've been talking about non-residential. And for the agricultural customers, that would be uh, some pretty dramatic increases in percentages. And I think the stakeholder advisory group recommendation there was to limit those to uh, no more than 10% per year. 10%, yeah. So. It seems to me that the uh, stakeholder rec group recommendations are uh, are are, uh, are are good. Um, the um, I guess uh, well, the next question is really about the uh, you know for the water system facility charges. I know that it is it re it's it's calculated based on recovering what the expenses are. Um, and I guess the question is, you know, these have been in place since 1993. So the, 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 the new rates are, I assume, calculated based on essentially current, um, the current uh, costs of, of doing these things. Um, however, you know, this would probably be in place for another 20 years. Um, so I, I guess there isn't any consideration on um, you know, WSFCs uh, in the future, or is that just the lesson that you should, we should really do it every five years so we don't get so far behind? My, my personal opinion is that you should update it more frequently, perhaps every five years as you're currently planning to do with your water rates. Uh, one thing, uh, uh, Board Member Babcock too, is that uh, uh, we want to time this with also updates to our water master plan, our, our infrastructure plans, which uh, gives us an idea of what kind of capacities we need, uh, where we're going to develop, and what the estimated cost would be. So it provides like a good basis for these charges. Uh, I, I would agree with you that uh, 1993 to now is kind of a really long time. And uh, so we're kind of doing this catch up, but uh, because the board took action in 2016 to approve the water master plan and got us into a long-term capital program with also long-term financial planning that provides a good basis to try to understand what these costs are, are based on. Yeah, I would echo um, that um, as, an, as an agency, you kind of want to avoid, you know, rate, rate shock. And the way you avoid rate shock is you implement, um, you know, increases as necessary and you review them periodically. So hopefully, I don't know how many of us are going to be around um, next, next time, but hopefully there's going to be some institutional knowledge that will uh, kick in in five years or, or so, so that this can be revisited again so that the agency doesn't get too far behind. I, in terms of um, recouping its costs. I totally agree. Okay, so my, my last question, I think, is um, is about the whole idea of, of rate shock. I, I agree that there is a rate shock. The rate shock issue is really true with water use rates. Um, but I don't 
quite see it as clearly with respect to WSFC. Uh, I don't think it's the same people. Um, I, I wonder um, who is really worried so much about WSFCs. Um, if it's developers, uh, I guess it's people building a new home. Um, but those are, um, they don't seem to be very big. 18% sounds like a lot, but it's really not a lot of money uh, in consideration of, of the work that's being done that requires this, this meter. Uh, it's a very small uh, fee in relation to, to the development, it seems to me. Uh, so I, um, I can understand that you would have a lot of, uh, did you get a lot of pushback that you wanted to raise water rates by 18%? Um, uh, and, and you would need to think about phasing in, but um, I guess just personally, I don't see this as a uh, as uh, as big of a deal, and, I, and I'm not sure who who would uh, I guess have a big problem uh, with it. I mean, it, it doesn't seem like it's my it's my neighbors or or regular uh, John Q. Public. So. I I would agree with Roger in most cases. The one exception is the agriculture rates. I agree. I think, yep. far, I think small farmers are really they really look at all of those individual rates. And the jump that we have on the those ag facility charges are pretty significant. But the rest of the, the rest of the users, I agree, Roger. You're right. I, uh, if I could share, uh, we we did uh, do this. So we have reached out to stakeholder, different stakeholder groups already, uh, the developer development community and also the farming community. And I would uh, echo uh, board member Soon's uh, concern when we shared this with the agriculture community. Uh, there were I I kind of mentioned I'm glad everybody's sitting down in the room when I share these numbers with you. And they were kind of they were shocked, uh, but they at the time also realized that they do use a lot of water and that they didn't have a good handle on how much water they were uh, using on the property. They just uh, got the biggest meter they could get. Um, so you have agriculture customers, you know, because when the facilities charge was developed back in 1993, it sort of treated the farmers like your homeowners. But like what uh, Dave shared, when we look at it, the median agricultural customer uses the equivalent of uh, 6,000 gallons, I mean, the 6,000 gallons a day, which is equivalent to uh, the median single family residential customers use on a daily basis. So in a month, they use the equivalent of 30 homes uh, for one month's worth of water. Um, uh, so there is a big catch up there, but, but they also represent a very small proportion of uh, our usage in our system. I, you know, we are open to the board member's suggestion uh, for how to proceed forward. So I should probably speak. Um, I think I'm the only member of the permitted action, permitted interaction group that um, is present. Um, so what I would say again is, you know, if this was a private business, I can see, okay, wanting to go and, and reset the cost immediately so that we can recover all of our costs. Um, as a public agency, we serve all, you know, the, all different types of, um, of the population. I do understand um, Member Babcock's um, point that, you know, we're, this is the only people who probably want to pay attention to this at, at first will be the developers and the, the dollar amount itself is um very small uh in relatively um but i think the discussion in the group was the concern that you know 18 percent is 18 percent. that's a double digit increase almost 20 percent. and in this age not only of covid but we talk about affordable housing and what our values are as an agency um i think that's where this proposal comes I guess if the majority of the board 
feels differently, I mean, we certainly can reopen the discussions. Uh, we, we would like to go to the public and get something done, though, sooner rather than later, given that it's been so long. And this does give us a plan moving forward. Uh, Chair, but I'm open. Uh, Chair, if I could maybe suggest an idea here. Right now, uh, uh, can you draw a very go to the summary of WSFC options uh, slide, the table there, which has options one, two, and three? Uh, board board members, if you go to the PowerPoint, yeah, this table here, uh, and Dave, uh, weigh in on this, and Barry, please, uh, just throwing out an idea, because uh, right now we're looking at going out and reaching out to the community to gauge their, their thoughts and feedback and reactions on this, is we could always add another column here that shows uh, just a, a rapid increase to bring it up to cost, you know, like uh, doing the 18% on the single family residential increase in year one, uh, rather than, uh, than spreading it out over multiple years. And then that would give us a feel of how, uh, how people, what they think about that when we mm -hmm. go out and do our, our community engagement process. And we can bring that information back and feedback back to the board. Um, I hate to say it, but I think that's really going to bias it. The people are going to not see it in the way that Roger, I think, appropriately phrased it. Um, seeing an 18% increase on anything is going to have immediate pushback. That, that option will go by the by immediately. Well, uh, board member soon, I think right now that. Uh, people are uh, in the current economic situation. People are we're trying to be very sens uh, sensitive to the the issue of affordability for our customers. And, and yeah, in the scheme of a, a median household price of a home might be nine hundred thousand dollars right now uh, on Oahu, and it doesn't seem like a large cost. But, uh, maybe maybe a Maybe if I could just um, <clears throat> to recap what the stakeholder advisory group recommendations were for each of these, and we can imagine a fourth column here. For the single family residential, their recommendation was to phase it in over three years. For multi unit uh, residential, both low rise and high rise, their recommendation was no phase in because the numbers were, you know, six and a half to seven and a half percent. Um, for non-residential, <clears throat> similarly, they recommended no phase in. And for agriculture, their recommendation is actually option one, a 10% maximum increase. So if that if that helps in your conversation. And Dave, I think uh, their, their uh, the stakeholder advisory group recommendation for single family residential is pretty much the same as option one, right? About three years is about five percent, a little over five percent yeah, per year. Yeah, it's pretty close to that. Yeah. So what I was going to um, suggest, um, given the comments, um, members Babcock, members Soon, given your comments, what we could do, I mean, if you go, because if we go with these options, option one, two, and three, I'm pretty sure the public and whether they can afford it or not, they're going to say, they're going to pick the most beneficial one, right, to them, which would be, I guess would be options two and three. We could not have option two and three and just go with option one. And that will get us to where we need to be quicker um, without having, you know, a, you know, a, an 18% increase. I think 5%, I think people will, will, will stomach that, will, you know, so uh, well, one thing we can do is when we go to the public, we'll just go with option one. If that's kind of what everybody wants to do is to get to the target as quick as possible. Uh.
<laughs> we're, we're, open so, to, uh, we're open to moving this process forward. And um, Member um, Anthony, I, I saw yeah. your hand go on. Mr. Chairman, could I ask a question? Like, do you, and I, I apologize if, if this came up already, but could you, like if you went and started to look at option one, what are the actual numbers you would see in like a common single family home um, in dollars every month from, from year to year? Do you, do you guys have that information, Andy? Yeah, so I think um, Mr. Wusagawa can pull that up on the graph here um, so you can see it. Thank you. But I, I guess the point with um, R Roger's point is that it's not a, it's not an ongoing expense that you know, homeowners are going to have to deal with. It's a one-time expense at the very beginning when you build, when you basically when you build a house, right? I mean, uh, or you request a larger meter. What were you? So a brand new meter or a meter. larger meter. Yeah. So you feel it that one okay. time, and that's it. Yeah. So for a typical three-bedroom, two-bath house, it's thirty-seven hundred dollars currently. That's a one-time fee. Has to be paid. Uh, concurrent with the issuance of the permit, and that would go up to $4,389. Okay. So, so one approach is if we say implement that in year one, uh, then that's the, that's the difference of between those numbers will be the increase of $700. David, if we went to full implementation, would it go from 3,700 to 4389 in the first year? That's correct. Okay, so what happens to all the money that's lost over those four years before we reach total? What happens to it is that those, you're still, well, assuming that you're still building those projects, yeah. then the costs of those projects are spread across your entire rate base. So your, your water rates, if you're not collecting money that you need through this mechanism, you're collecting it through your general water rates. So everybody okay, so that, getting. So that's important to know. Um, yeah, the other other aspects of that too is the uh, the current waiver for the 500 units uh, to be uh, waived, the water system facilities charge and the meter initial meter cost also yep. is. Uh, uh, we're not collecting that revenue, so we make it up to uh, water rate and web revenue, not through the water system right. facility charge. Uh, and right. this year, we, we, for the first time, exceeded 500 units uh, by a little bit. Yeah. Which is to celebrate. Well, yeah, I'm not saying that's nothing bad, but you know that means the pace of development of affordable units is picking up, and that's a good, good yeah. indicator for our community. Yeah, that's that's good. I think that the um, um, it'll be a real important, I, Dave. I think when the presentations are done, that you you know you mentioned, of course, that this is a one-time fee uh, at the start, and also that that last point I, I think is really important that um, we either collect it from the folks that we should be collecting it from when we're incurring you know for expanding the system due to new users. So new users should be paying that as opposed to all the rest of the customer base paying for it. Um, so I, I think that's a critical point. And I think, I think that there should be at least two options, perhaps that option one, and then option two is to, uh, but you could have more options too. I, I don't think it matters how many options you have, you have more. But one should, of course, be the, the one that's kind of related to the stakeholder uh, advisory group with the, the instantaneous uh, coming up to what it should be. And maybe if I could just add, I think um, anytime you're going to raise anything by double digits and, you know, 18%, almost 20% in one step, it just, it's just asking for, um, for us to be on the front page. And, you know, um, if, if there's ways to ease into this, this is, thank you for um, pointing out that it's one time fee. And I think the the idea behind that is, is, is fairly simple. I think it just, it just opens up the, the conversation about, uh, and there was an earlier comment about just the time space that we're in and maybe the struggle that some, some folks are in. 
Um, although if you're building a million dollar house, uh, maybe that struggle isn't as as defined as um, as as those guys who are trying to trying to get rent relief right now. Um, and especially if you're going to amortize it across thirty years in a build through a mortgage, then those are just uh, pennies. I just the, the I think the sticker shock of the eighteen percent is the is the challenge that we might have. Yeah. yeah. I agree. Um, uh, yeah, and I can just say by actual experience, uh, when it gets to a double, close to a double digit increase, uh, we, we do feel more pain uh, publicly, you know, from that. Um, just uh, can keep, keep in mind too that this is not necessarily going to be affecting only developers, uh, but it could be a regular person trying to uh, build an additional dwelling unit on their property say for their in-laws or as a rental income to help make ends meet and the cost and they want a separate water meter for it you know, so that cost of that meter will just be that much more expensive and uh, what the chair was saying is how do we gradually we we waited this long since 1993 uh, rather than trying to catch up like in a one or two year period can we spread it out and try to is the uh, the impact of the change uh, and I really applaud the board members for their your willingness to look at updates to our water system facilities charges because that's very important to us but just uh, think carefully how we do it although at this time the risk is low well we could get blowback from the media for what we put on the table as draft but we are actually trying to uh, send this up and uh, make it uh, publicly known and let people comment on it and react to it. Uh, so it doesn't mean that the board is going to make the decision yet, uh, but uh, it is a time to uh, kind of go out with these uh, different proposals in whatever form that you folks want us to proceed on. I think I do think one thing is missing and maybe came in the beginning and I apologize for being late. Um, but if I saw somebody, if one of you came to me and said, look, you're building a new house is going to cost you 18% more than it would have last year. I would want to know why. I would want to know where's that money going? How much money do we collect and how much do you need to collect? And I don't see any conversation about the amounts of money that are collected from these facility charges and what's necessary. And, and that, that may be a really difficult thing to calculate, but you got to be able to do something. We came up with very specific 18.54 increases. Um, so how much money do we collect? How much money do we have to collect in order to support the facility development that's planning in the planning in the works? Can you, uh, can you do that? Uh, yeah, yes, we can. Um, it's not in this presentation, but, but Ray, you hit on a very important point that uh, I've kind of forgotten is you start with the why. Why do you need to do this? Why is yeah. this important to our community, to our water system? And once people can understand the why, then the how, even though they may not like it, becomes a little bit much easier for them to to take in because they understand why this is needed. So good point. We'll make sure it's part of our outreach materials. Okay. Um, David, I know you, you you might I don't know who brought us to this page, but the fact that we haven't adopted ones since 1993 is not a good enough reason. There may be no reason to increase it. Um, so the the why is is the costs i mean what costs have increased what what is required what's necessary to cover the costs of growth related projects etc yeah i those are great suggestions thank you thanks okay so let's see um are you how about we go with option one and the stakeholder advisory groups recommendation. Well, we put those two out or 
What, what do you guys think? I think it's okay to have multiple options. Uh, we'll see yeah. what they say, and then we're still we still get to decide, you know, what to do. Um, the, the the last suggestion I would have is to uh, um, when we talk about percentages, um, it is it is challenging when you get to big numbers, but um, you don't necessarily have to emphasize percentages. Percentages of a small number is is a small number. Uh, percentages of a big number are a big number. Uh, so, uh, you know, for a single family home, it's going up by $700. Um, that does happen to be 18%, but it's $700. So, uh, anyway, so, there's different ways to, to present numbers. So, uh, anyway, that's fine. That's all. So. I have a point of clarification for Dave. Um, we, we pull in about 8 million a year in facilities charges currently. Yeah, Barry, my, my recollection is it's in the eight to 10 million a year range on average right now. Yeah, mm -hmm. out of 232. Thank you. That's good information. Okay, so let's see, option, we, let's, do we have a motion um, to um, allow, the department to seek um, public input on the draft changes to the water system facilities charges. Um, and with the with the recommendation or with the understanding that we'll have three <laughs> options with the board uh, stakeholder advisory group as an option. Is there is there a motion? Is that a question? Uh, is, would that be option three? Um, filling in the other options is that what you? Because there there were a couple of recommendations on the multi-unit one as well, or single family. Well, that was the pig. Sorry. I think the pig one is option two, right? Option one and option two. That's that's what came out of the pig. Oh, five, yeah, five, five years. Oh, okay. yeah, yeah. Op two was in the pig. Option two is is really reflective of the of the pig recommendation. Um, the stakeholder advisory group recommendation is um, is again uh, a three year phase in on single family residential, which is about five percent. It's a little higher than that no phase in on multi-unit, no phase in on non-residential, and then a 10% maximum on agriculture. So Dave, so there's nothing on the uh, stakeholders group in any of the option one or two? There's no. none of their recommendation on option one or two? Option, no. option one for single family is closest to what they recommended. Okay, so, well, but, Technically, really, it's not there. So, what you're recommending, uh, Chair, is for that group to have option three. Yeah, we could populate uh, option yeah. three. Comments. So, you so the recommendation by the chair is to take option three and populate that with the recommendation of the stakeholders group. Yes. Okay. Great. Just to be clear. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Uh, is uh, was that a yeah. motion, member? Uh, so moved. Okay. Okay. So it's been uh, moved by uh, member Sword. Um, do I have a second? Second. Okay. Was that member Badcock? Yes. Thank you. Um, is there any uh, further discussion at this time? All right. Uh, all those in favor say aye. 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 Okay, I hear eyes um, unanimously. Is there, are there any no names? We should actually um, strike that. Um, let's take a roll call vote, uh, Madam Secretary. Okay. Board Member Ray Soon. Aye. Board Member Max Sword. Aye. 
Board Member La Regu Anthony. Aye. Aye. Board Member Jay Gutai. Aye. Board Member Roger Babcock. Aye. And Chair Brennan Diaz. Aye. Chair, motion passes with six values. All right. Thank you, members. Um, we're going to move on to the next item. Uh, uh, Chair, if I could, uh, board members, would you, uh, if you would like, we could uh, uh, revise the options and just do it as an informational item at the next board meeting, if you would like, uh, or we could just communicate with each board member. Um, I think somebody communicate with each member. Okay. okay. Yeah. All right. Uh, first up, item for information is the water systems revenue bonds. And it's the compliance with the rate uh, covenant per our uh, financial policy. Chair recognizes Mr. Joe Cooper. Good afternoon, board chair, board members. Um, I'm here to give our um, report on compliance with our rate covenant um, according to Article 8, Section 802 of the water rates and charges of our revenue bond resolution number 717-2001. Um, after examining our um, financial and accounting records, um, we're required to um, make an opinion whether we have adequate rates and charges to support our net revenue requirements. Um, and I just as a little bit of background, basically, this is our um, debt service. Um, our bonds, were, when we issue bonds, we are required to um, covenant that um, our revenues after we pay our operating expenses are enough to pay um, the debt service on our bonds. Um, and so after reviewing our Net revenues uh, projected for 2001 and for 2002. Um, we are here to report that our net revenue is not less than that is required. Attached are two sheets. One is the projection for um, June 20, for the end of this year, where we anticipate to have um, net revenues at, at a ratio of 5.15 of our required debt covenant. Um, our requirement is 1.2. So 5.15 exceeds that. Next year, we expect that our net revenues will be 3.06, again, exceeding the um, net revenue requirement required by our bond. Um, that concludes my report. I'll be happy to answer any questions or take any comments. OK, members, any questions? All right, uh, hearing none. Um, is there a, I'm, well, this is a item for information. Yes. Um, so barring any comments or questions, um, thank you very much. Okay. Mr. Cooper. Thank you. Thanks, nice Joe. All right, next item for information is uh, the update of the Commission on Water Resource Management action regarding more the water supplies by equal tunnel and chair recognizes Mr. Barry Usaga and uh, Manager Law. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Mr. Chair and members. Do you mind? And my shots. Um, <laughs> so, updating the Water Commission's action as of June 15th, uh, 2021, where they issued an order requiring <coughs> Board of Water Supply to reduce. The hypotonal production for 1 million gallons per day to 0 0.3 MGD, and then evaluate the feasibility of installing another bulkhead in Haiku Tunnel. Um, they, the reason for that was their 
setting interim in-stream flow standards for HES stream. <clears throat> and they've um, indicated that there's substantial ecological and cultural values supported by HEA stream, including habitat for native amphidamodrous species, sorry, <laughs> restored native riparian environment, healthy estuarine and nature ecosystems, recreation aesthetic values, as well as productivity of the HEA fish pond and wetland uh, to support um, food production, uh, we call it. Uh, and their goal is to restore the stream to pre-tunnel base flow. The tunnel was constructed in 19, in the early 1940s. Um, so as an interim measure until the uh, tunnel is fully bulkheaded, uh, we are required to reduce withdrawal from the tunnel to 0.3 by August 15th, 2021. Um, and when the bulkheading process commences, uh, the tunnel will be allowed to uh, flow directly into the into Hia stream. <clears throat> there are implementation requirements that within two years, <clears throat> we would complete our feasibility study and preliminary engineering design for the proposed bulkhead. Um, we'll communicate with the commission and coordinate with the landowners and the restoration groups there. There's several. <clears throat> Papahana Kuoola, uh, Kako Ivi on uh, HCDA land, uh, the Hi'ia National Estuarine Research Reserve, and the fish pond is called Paipai o Hi'ia, and we will do so on a quarterly basis. Upon completion of the feasibility study and engineering design, a BWS will have three years to complete the final design and construction of the bulkhead. Following the installation of the bulkhead, uh, we will work with Sea uh, Worm and the landowners and partners to determine what a feasible number is in establishing a numeric in-stream flow standard for here stream. Um, and if we determine that the bulkheading is not feasible, uh, then they will move to amend the inner inch flow standard or um, probably reduce our water use permits for our three sources there, which is Haiku Tunnel, Haiku Well, and Iole Ka'a Well. Uh, there's monitoring requirements. Um, will be maintained by BWS, coordinating with USGS, which we already do. Um, in monthly intervals, we would provide daily flow data withdrawn from Haiku Tunnel, Haiku Well, and Ile Kao Well, and then conduct periodic biological surveys of the stream uh, subject to available funding. It wasn't quite quite clear as to who would do the biological surveys, but that was a uh, you know a requested requirement. In terms of reporting, at the commission's September 20, 21st meeting, we would provide an update on our success, our progress to reduce uh, tunnel flow to 0.3. Right now, it's at 0.5, um, down from actually down from 1.3 to one to 0.5, and now we're asked to bring it down another 200,000 gallons per day. Um, and then uh, assess the reduction of the tunnel and the benefit of on the flow of the stream, uh, report on our progress on the bulkhead feasibility study, and the potential development of alternative sources, including the state hospital well. <clears throat> The reason this is in there is because the state hospital is the largest water user in that 500 system. And they are going to be reopening in August and uh, increasing their water demand um, from 25,000 gallons per day to 100,000 um, with an expansion uh, plan of increasing it to 200,000. So um, they get, Haiku tunnel water directly. Uh, so, but they have a well on, on site with they're not, what they're not using. So um, evaluating that potential to uh, convert from 
I could tunnel to a, an on-site well. Um, following the, the bulkheads, um, the bulkhead, they will uh, evaluate the results and effects and set an entry flow standard or um, reduce our permitted use. As a side note, we, as a proactive uh, action, uh, we are entering into a cooperative study with the U.S. Geological Survey to conduct a three-year, three-phase watershed study, total cost of 875000 of which is cooperatively shared. Uh, USGS's share is 350000 for the water supply share is 525000 and that we will fund that in the FY22 water resources budget. Uh, the study has uh, the following scope. Uh, determining the effect of the reduction of withdrawals on groundwater discharge to streams that can be detected in stream flow measurements and stream gauge records. Uh, estimate how much the water withdrawn from the tunnel and wells in the Hia watershed comes from outside the watershed. So it may be extracting water from the leeward side. Uh, it may be uh, restoring water, not just in Hia stream, but in Ile Ka. It may be neighboring watersheds. Uh, there's a lot that we don't know. so. USGS study is um, essential. Um, identifying the gaining and losing reaches of Hia stream and quantifying current seepage. So uh, we know the streams are gaining above and below the rain, the, the stream gauge. So where are they? And in what stream segments and which streams? And then quantifying the current water uses to the extent possible from existing data and short term measurements. And lastly, the installation of a new stream gauge below the confluence of the Hia and Ileka streams, or it may be on Ileka stream and operated on a multi year period going forward. Uh, that's our update, and I'd be happy to answer any questions. Members, any questions? Hey, you have time. Where? I could. I could. I mean, no. Okay, yeah. Sorry. I uh, what area does that serve? That's the central plain? Oh no, it it, it serves Kadioe. So oh, Kadioe side? yeah. Oh, okay. Haiku Valley. Right, right now it uh, at at point at point five. Um, it it basically serves the uh, Haiku Valley, Haiku plantations, Haiku village, uh, the area around um, Keahala Road. Which is Winter Community College, the right. State Hospital, the right. two parks. At point three, it'll just serve that area. And then in the summer, point three is actually not enough. Uh, just from that point three, they'll use more. So what what are you proposing is that the uh, to reactivate the well over at the at the uh, hospital? Dylan I drilled a well in two thousand right next to their tank that's right above the hospital. Uh -huh. They renovated and created this huge uh, modern uh, combination hospital right, prison right. Yeah. yeah so yeah. it's a deal and our drilled the well in 2000 we're asking them to evaluate putting a pump in that and then pumping it into their system and using that water which is in a different stream system than it yeah um, and then getting off haiku tunnel water and that'll help us reduce their demand right. down to potentially meet the point three but it's it's right there it's very close so the, the all the housing in that area would be affected by the reduction is what you said. It's it's affected when the demand approaches the the, the fixed input of yeah. point three. When the demand reaches that or exceeds that, and the reservoir levels start to drop. Okay, so where is it at this point in time to the point three? Where is it at this time? In other words, is it at eighty percent of that? Or? Well, I think we're down at around 0.5 coming out of the tunnel right now. We have it at 0.5. Oh, right now. Yeah. Oh, okay. but, but we have to be evaluating to drop it to 0.3. In the summer, we wouldn't be able to serve that area. Uh, um, so you're looking at low pressures in the upper elevations of that system. So that affects all the Kapunala area and Kanoe, Kapunala. But don't you live in Kapunala? <laughs> <laughs> I live in Haiku Valley. Oh, Haiku Valley. Okay. Yeah, it'll affect my neighbors that are at the very top of the elevation, at the top of uh, Hokulele subdivision, top of Haiku Village subdivision, where they're right up at the 400 foot elevation, including the hospital. 
Uh, so they'll experience potentially fluctuations in pressure, low pressure when everybody's using water. Okay, with, with or without the, the, their, uh, their uh, well, without their well. Without their well, well yeah. yeah. We once we crank it down to point three, we'll find out. Okay. Uh, yeah. Uh, just uh, board member sword. We're also uh, going to get the Haiku well back online. Mm -hmm. It's getting very close to being able to pump again. Oh, okay. uh, which is feeds into the same system there. Right. And there's the one question is, is the point three just a tunnel or is it point three for the, the three sources there? That's still not determined yet. Okay, that's, that's to be determined. Okay. Yeah. But we could pump the well. I think we asked for, we, we informed the commission that we may have to pump the well once it's online. And that's why the August 15th giving us, date uh, is. Yeah, giving okay. us time to get the well and uh, back online. Okay. okay. Other members? Um, Ray, I think you're on mute. Is he trying to? I, I'm not sure. Yeah, he's off of mute. Oh, he's back, okay. back on mute again. Uh, Ray, you still on mute? He's off mute. Barry, should we feel anxious here? Is this something to be really concerned about? And if it is, is there any recourse or what's the long term plan here? I mean, what what how concerned should we as members be? In your very opinion? good question. Um, we, we are in the um, uh, the evaluation stage. Um, they haven't set an entry and flow standard. They're just requiring us to cut to point three, and then we'll update them in September. Um, in September, October, we may start to see, um, you know, if there are if there are pressure issues, we'll hear it in September, October. Um, but that's why we were proposing the hospital well. That once they if they can put their additional demand on the well and not on Haiku Tunnel, then it may be possible to stay within the point three. But you know, the evaluation will take several months, probably different seasons too. Summer is the is the is the hardest for us, but it is also affecting the stream too. So you know it's it's a it's a push pull kind of deal. Um, but we'll we'll need more time to evaluate that. But I, I'm just informing that from my staff's evaluation, we're pretty close to that. But yeah, Barry, I, I got the impression that point three was an interim point and that you're really gonna get to zero. Is that not true? They have not indicated that zero was on the table. Uh, Ernie, I don't know if yeah, you... Yeah, no, uh, Ray, they haven't said zero out of Haiku Tunnel. Uh, okay. They also, I think they understand, too, that there are some customers that depend on that, like Kamakao Charter School. That's probably the highest elevation customer in that system. And they come off directly from the Haiku Tunnel uh, for their fire protection water. And that's on Hawaiian homelands. Uh, okay. So right now they're taking us down to point three. Uh, their initial interim in stream flow standard proposal back in January was uh, measured at the uh, USGS gauge on uh, HIA stream. And the idea is to maintain a flow of uh, minimum 1.77 MGD. So we, we, are, we are dropping water from the 500 system to the lower 272 system. So my staff is look, working with our operations to reduce that drop and okay. make more water available in the upper system. Um, but most of it is in Luluku and it doesn't really move back to Haiku. So it's a, it's a conveyance uh, hydraulic issue that we're evaluating now. Um, if you just look at supply and demand, you know, there should be sufficient but it's just the way the system is currently operated so we just need more time to give you a, a real good evaluation yeah and also for board members to you know that we uh, uh the commission in a previous meeting also identified uh, a contractor with usgs for similar studies and 
Kahalu and Wahe. Uh, and the anticipation there, maybe at some point in the future, they may want to amend the interim and stream flow standards in Kahalu and Wahe. And I think at that point, you know, that Wahe is our largest tunnel source in the Kola Poko system. Uh, a major water producer for us. So um, uh, the combined effect of Hayiku Tano flow reduction, Waihe and Kahalu uh, could be, uh, uh, have significant consequences to our, our Kola Poko water system all the way up to Ormanama. Okay, uh, any further uh, questions or comments? Okay, if none, um, thank you very much, um, Mr. Segal. Please keep us updated um, on further developments on this issue. Hey, Chair? Yes. Chair, this is Ray Soon. I got to get off. Uh, I'm sorry. I'm losing connectivity. I'm, I'm borrowing a, a computer and I'm going to. It's um it's ten o'clock at night here and uh, <laughs> I I sorry I gotta lose connectivity. Okay, no, no bye bye. Thanks, thanks for joining us. Okay, aloha. Aloha. All right. Um, next item is item number three for thanks, inspiration. Barry. You're welcome. Um, and we'll actually before we move on to the next item, um, Mr. Nordstrom, has there been any um uh, anyone um at all from the time? No, no, testimony. Testimony. no testimony. Okay, Madam Secretary, have we received any uh, testimony besides what may be noted on the agenda already? No. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Let the record so reflect. Next item is um, my account e portal project update. Chair recognizes uh, Ms. Jennifer Elfman. Thank you, Board Chair and Board Members. Um, I appreciate the opportunity to brief you today on the ePortal project that we've been working on. Okay, so today our customers can go to the Board of Water Supply homepage and click on the My Account button here in the upper right hand corner to access the portal where they would register and log in and then proceed to this homepage where they can obtain their account balance get a copy of their electronic bill and make a payment. About 27,000 account holders use the service today to pay their bill each month. It represents about 19% of the total payments made to the Board of Water Supply so far this year. Board of Water Supply does not assess a transaction or a service fee for the credit or debit card transactions made through the portal. And those payments are made by single family residential rate payers only. And that's due to a contract requirement. So due to the need for a new contract, and thanks to the efforts of our call center personnel and IT staff, we're converting to a new portal and we're making some enhancements that are going to be effective September 1st. So the new portal will be branded to match our corporate website. And the viewing and navigation experience will be improved because no matter whether you're using your mobile phone, a tablet, or a desktop, the pages will render in a way that's appropriate for viewing with that particular device. There will also be increased security. CAPTCHA is what it's called. And so you're probably familiar with this. Um, you follow the instructions and you click on the uh, thing that they're asking you to click on to prove that you're a human. In addition to that, uh, there will be more information and functionality. So people can make payments to their Board of Water Supply account without registering or having to log in. And that's a benefit when say a parent or a roommate, somebody else wants to pay the bill. Customers will also be able to log in and send messages and requests to us securely. They'll be able to view their billing and payment history at a glance and export that information. So the timeline is 
we're wrapping up our user acceptance testing and next month we plan to do an employee rollout. We'd like to get our employees to use the system and provide us feedback. Then we'll start customer outreach in August. And that's because existing users need to do two things. We need them to register for the site and then re-enroll in paperless billing. And our outreach to customers will be ongoing. We'll go live on September 1st. So today, instead of doing a demonstration, what we'd like to do is showcase what our communications office put together. It's a video for our customers and they did a great job. Okay. Oops. There we go. The Honolulu Board of Water Supply has a new way of checking, managing, and paying your bill online anytime. Now that you have your account registered, let's log in and make a payment. First, go to boardofwatersupply.com and click on the handy My Account button. That will take you to our login screen. Enter the login and password which you created when you registered your new online account, then click the I'm not a robot checkbox. You may have to solve a puzzle before you can continue. For example, the puzzle may ask you to click all the pictures of parking meters in a grid. This is to prove that you're human. Just follow the directions in the puzzle window. Once you have passed the robot test, you will be logged into your account and you'll be welcomed to the account overview page. Here, you can check your account balance, enroll in paperless billing, or make a payment. You can also check your bill history edit your profile, or send a message to the Board of Water Supply with my request. Click the Make Payment button to pay your bill with a debit or credit card. Select your payment amount and click the checkbox to accept the terms of use, then press Continue. The next page will ask you to verify payment information. Check the information, then press Continue. Next, you'll be asked to provide your credit card information. As a reminder, BWS only accepts Visa, MasterCard, or Discover credit or debit card payments online for single-family residential water service accounts. Once entered, press the Pay button, and you're done. That's it. Your payment is complete. Please allow up to two business days for the payment to be noted in your account. Need help? We're open Monday through Friday from 7.45 a.m. to 4.30 p.m. Call 808-748-5000 and press option 5 or email customer service at hbws.org. Mahalo. So that concludes my briefing. Are there any questions? I have a quick question. You made the comment that um, you didn't have to log in if you wanted to pay someone's bill. That's correct. Uh, how would you know how, how to pay that person's bill if you don't have a... <coughs> You don't need login credentials, but you do need the customer's billing information. So, for example, if I wanted you to pay my bill, yeah. then I would give you my billing information and you would go to the site, okay. enter that, okay. and your credit card information. Okay. I'm just curious. Thanks. Okay. Any other questions? I'd like to say to you, listen carefully to the voice in this video, which is really professionally done uh, by our own communications staff. Oh, yeah? Uh, the person that uh, whose voice is actually Stephen Nordstrom. Uh, wow. He did a great job with that. Uh, okay. Uh, thank you. Thank Jack. you. Side job when you retire. Huh? There you go. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thank you. Thank you very much um, for the update. Um, are, are there any other questions from the board members? Okay. Thank you for the update. Thank you. And thank you, um, Stephen, for uh, the wonderful voice. <laughs> okay, we'll move on to the next item here. Um, this is the status update of groundwater levels at all index stations. Chair recognizes Mr. Barry Gitsugal. Hello again, Mr. Chair and members. 
Uh, okay, so this is the of the update of the groundwater levels in all stations. The two aquifer wells, in, um, the two aquifer in the index stations that are continuing to be in caution for May, and that's Punalu and Wailua. Uh, they're both. Uh, I'll show you the the head levels. Uh, the production for the month is 141 million gallons per day. Uh, we're currently in a low rainfall, uh, although um, for, for May it's 51%, and the five month moving average is 125%. So that's just a remnant of the high rainfall in, that we had in March. Um, but as of June, uh, the white drought monitor is showing abnormally dry conditions. Most of Oahu, except uh, portions of the windward side, in moderate drought conditions in the Pearl Harbor to Kapole. The National Weather Service is forecasting below no more precipitation for the summer months. And we just had a Oahu Drought Committee meeting a couple of weeks ago. Uh, this is chaired by the, uh, the Commission on Water Resource Management and uh, I'm one of the co-chairs as well. Um, and all of the major users, uh, farmers, um, uh, municipal utilities and uh, uh, survey research. Um, the National Weather Service said that their models are showing that the winter is going to be above normal. So we'll have a wet winter, thankfully, but the summer months, will, the, the, the below normal rainfall during the summer is going to extend um, potentially beyond October. So normally October is the start of the wet season. It's probably going to start later. Uh, you can't say when November or December. Um, but yeah, we we actually seen some dry dry uh, conditions in windward um, currently. Um, but most of the monitor wells we have are have uh, showing decreased head levels uh, because it's so hot and dry. Um, so I'll just go quickly through the. Um, just wanted to show you. Uh, So most of the water levels are in downward trend, but they're above the caution level. I'll show you Puna uh, Malu. So yeah, so this is Puna Malu. Um, into this area is the caution level. So Sixteen feet is the alert. So it's it's ranging in this in this uh, level there. Uh, Kaloa Nui, which is right next to Punalua, although it's, it's above, that's a good sign. Wahei Tano is back um, up. Um, late last year, it did drop quite a bit, um, but that has recovered. And Wailua is barely in the, uh, uh, the caution. In terms of rainfall, um, you know, big rains in January and March, that's why the five month moving average is high. Although we expect the summer months to be well below uh, normal. <clears throat> and production is above the five year monthly average, which is in the gray boxes here. So we're up at uh, up here. So earlier in the uh, you know, to, to April, May, June, well, you know, the, the production has been higher than the five month. Uh, we expect it to go higher. Um, but thankfully, there'll be some uh, above normal rainfall winter. Uh, that's my report. And if there are any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. Members, any questions? Okay, doing that. Thank you very much, uh, Gary, for the report. Thanks, Gary. All right, everyone. Um, the next item is item. Number five, uh, this is the water main repair report for um, May 2021. And um, today we have um, someone very special. Um, <laughs> he's been with us actually for the last couple of years, uh, but this is uh, going to be his uh, last uh, for, for now. <laughs> um, Terror recognizes Mr. Uh, Mike Pukki. So we have um please accept oh, this today <laughs> from us. Thank you. Thank you very much for all that you do. Um it's really a big round of applause. 
Thank you. We have to do all of it. It's really, um, you know, uh, public service, you know, like uh, you provided that makes um, agencies like the Board of Water Supply. Thank you very much. Um, it's been a kind of quick 45 years has gone by, but you know, hard to imagine. But it actually was about 50 years ago I started working with the board. Somebody told me I work for all the managers except the first two, which is actually correct. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, the main break report, there were 26 main breaks during the month of May. Uh, the average time took us to repair the uh, four, six, and eight was approximately 10 hours, um, 10 hours. Um, the leak detection team surveyed 18 miles. And they found 79, using utilities, they found 79 meter couplings and uh, three leaks on uh, service main. So that's basically the report. But the thing that I want to also talk about today is what's going on right now on uh, Monolo Road with the 42 inch main break. Um, 42 inch main break started, took place uh, on June 18th. Uh, it occurred when a, a Navy contract or a military contractor was drilling a new sewer line across the freeway through the using direction of drilling um, hit our main and caused our 42 inch to leak. Um, they hit a main at approximately the, what they call the six o'clock position. They bore through the concrete jacket as well as hitting our pipe, causing our pipe to leak. Um, usually, our, usually when you get a main break, the normal repair the process we repair is we expose the exterior. And from the exterior, we, we weld our uh, repair work on it. However, in, in this particular case, um, the main brick occurred off the freeway, you know, in a shoulder, a little off the shoulder, into the shoulder area of the main uh, the freeway. And, and it was very, very deep. It's 25 feet plus that we had to excavate to get down if we were going to do the repair a normal way. Um, right next to us is, was a retaining wall for the, um, for the on-ramp. The main break occurred uh, right by Shafter, by the way, the on-ramp going down to the freeway by Shafter. Um, when we excavated down about 16 feet just to get to the top of the jacket, uh, we were starting to undermine that retaining wall. Um, so, you know, we started to compromise. We didn't want to compromise. We could see if we went deeper to the 25, 26 feet we needed, we would have compromised that retaining wall. Also, too, if we went deeper, our excavation would have to go into the freeway. Uh, if, if we, we would excavate our excavation, we go further Malka. You know, right now there are four lanes there, so we have one lane block. But if we kept going to excavate, it would guarantee we have to block at least another lane. So we would have sque uh, squeezed out four lanes down to two lanes, and we would have a really traffic nightmare, um, really, really bad. On the west side of the break, um, there's a sewer manhole, an active sewer manhole that is a collection for all of Shafter. So it's not a case we have to, you know, we could go in there and just break the manhole. So we had issues with this, trying to repair our normal traditional way. So we, you know, we, we brainstormed, we talked about it among ourselves. And, and we were lucky in the sense that we could, then we were, we made contact with a welding company here locally. Actually, they're a national firm, the local office, said that they were, they were, they are able to weld in confined space. So that's when, Confined space and in a wet condition. They do a lot of welding at the, at the shipyard, Pearl Harbor shipyard. So they're familiar with wet confined um, conditions. So with that, we decided, okay, we're gonna weld, fix this pipe from the inside. So in that way, we don't have to excavate as deep, but we could go from the inside. So from there, we broke, broke the jacket off the top of the pipe. We made an access into the pipe so that um, the welding company could get in, into the pipe and do the welding. Um, this past weekend, the welding company did the repair of the pipe. Um, after they were done, they, we came back and we, and we had another company come in, a welding company come in and repair the access that we had made so that we could get to the pipe. Currently, right now, we are flushing the line. Um, hopefully, we can get the line back in service um, sometime later this week. So we're working on right that uh, right now. When the uh, welding company went in there, they cut out the, the broken main. And this is what they cut out. This is the damage that occurred. This is on the bottom, on the bottom like this with, with the, 
the 42 inch main running this way and they were drilling across and then nipped us here underneath and created this hole. So, so this is what they, they cut out. They welded a new patch on top uh, to, to cover this up what they cut out. And that's the part. This is in, all inside the 42 inch water main. Okay, then we came back and we, we closed it up and that's where we are right now. It's, you know, trying to flush the main out so we can put it back in service. Okay. Right. That's a yeah, are there any questions? No, other than uh, I commended, yeah. I commended uh, Chief Engineer Lau that uh, I, I, I thought it was a great idea that um, the public was notified about what you folks were going to do. Uh, yeah. Because I said, you know, when you leave people to their own thoughts and everything, uh, you know, they'd, they'd be cursing us off about closing up the freeway and everything. So I'm glad that you folks did that. But I would also recommend, has that gone out to the public that you are completed and you're just finishing up uh, uh, flushing out and everything? I, 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 I would hold another press conference to, to uh, notify that because I, I think that's a very positive, uh, uh, in a very fun, put the Board of Water Supply in a very positive light instead of everybody cursing us every time we close down the <laughs> street or something. But I, I would definitely uh, get on the horn and, and highlight that, that it's repaired and you're in the process of flushing it out and it was successful. Uh, yeah. I think that's 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 great news that needs to go out at least uh, to the public. Yeah, thank you, Board Member Sword. Uh, something we can uh, plan on later in the week after we get our test results back. No, um, just tell them, tell them now and then give another result at the end of the week. Yeah. Let them know now that it's you know <laughs> you're doing you're doing a job. Yeah, that, that's 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 uh, you know good positive and. Uh, uh, I, I, I think uh, I would recommend uh, that uh, you folks do have a press conference and say, okay, it was, was, it was good, successful, the company did that, and we're in the process flushing, and we should be done, and let everybody know by the end of the week uh, that uh, you can drink the water again. Well, we have the system back up by the end of the week, but we still got to restore the area. We got a lot of restoration. Yeah, yeah, no, I understand that. But, you know, it, 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 it's always good to inform the public on, yes. on that type of news and, as opposed to negative news all the time. And everybody says, you got to notify a negative, I got to look at nothing. When it's positive, let them know as well. I, 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 I don't see anything wrong with that. No, okay. thank, thank you. So that's a very good suggestion. So we'll, we'll uh, get together and uh, look at what we can set up. Yeah. In terms of press, we've been using uh, press conferences. Yeah. And we're very fortunate that uh, enough uh, television stations and the star advertisers will come out for the press yeah. conference. And then the, we, like you say, in the absence of information, people tend to use their imagination. Usually it's kind of on the negative side. Well, yeah, you know, news, you watch the news, more than half of it is negative. You know, money gets a positive, and I'm pretty sure that. Uh, that's news that uh, the TV stations and the newspaper will be. Uh, yeah, and we want to really highlight the, uh, the the work that uh, field operations under Mike uh, Fuke's leadership and Jason, Jason Nikaido yeah. have been working uh, since this happened on March 8th, uh, uh, June 18th. They've been working uh, pretty much nonstop uh, till now. Yeah, and, that's, and, and they've you know, made some substantial progress uh, in getting the, the line repaired. Yeah, get that in the narrative. Just put it in the narrative. It's it's uh, nothing wrong with that. No, thank you. And Mike, uh, thank you for your great work on this. And your, yeah, just uh, throwing uh, about your retirement too. Oh, oh, no, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm really... just throwing your retirement in there. Yeah, you know, no, no. I'm with a with a flag <laughs> waving. <laughs> no, it's it's, uh, it's actually my assistant. He's the one really leading the the work out in the field. So. I yeah, it's always, it's always good. I'm, I'm, my number one thing is always, it's always positive news is always good. Right? good. Nothing thank wrong you. with that. Nothing wrong with that. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Okay. All right. Thank you, Mike. So, um, uh, hold on. Mm -hmm. Oh, so Mr. Chair, I got a question. I, I think it's uh, sure. not, not necessarily for Mike, but the, uh, so we, is it, it's, it would be normal to uh, be documenting um, 
costs and then be seeking that from the from the contractor? Is that correct? Uh, um, uh, board member Babcock, that is our typical process to because this is clearly a contractor damages that yep. we would uh, seek uh, to be made whole on the cost. Yep. Okay. That's what I figured. Thanks. Okay. Thank you. Thanks, Mike. Good job. And uh, congratulations. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks, you, Mike. Mike, so you can walk around like this, you know, now you have to retire. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> uh. <laughs> Okay, uh, final item for information today, um, and this is just for the record, we received um, correspondence in regards to um, an item we have in executive session is the proposed settlement of a claim relating to property damages. Um, the correspondence is public record, and it is not subject to any type of privilege, uh, so it is part of the public record, which um, all of you have been provided. Um, however, the discussions regarding the correspondence uh, may be subject to attorney-client privilege. Uh, therefore, it is uh, an item on our executive session, which we'll be going to be entering um, in the next minute or so. Uh, with that, uh, may I have a motion to enter into executive session? So moved. Okay, moved by um, Member Sword. Do I have a second? Second, second. Jay. Thank you, Thank you. Uh, Jay. Um, so it's been moved and seconded to go into the executive session. <coughs> All those in favor say aye. 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 Okay, all those opposed say nay. Right, let the record reflect that we've got a unanimous consent to move to executive session.